right. Hey, everybody. Welcome. This is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast, and I'm Joe McCall. we got a special little podcast here. Normally, I just do audio, and uh, but I met Dixie a few months ago in Ohio. She's from the good old state of Missouri. Do you say Missouri? <laughs> uh, I don't. <laughs> okay. Only wannabe nerds like me. Missouri. I'm from California. And so it's funny though, you see some of the people down South, deep South Missouri, we'll say uh wrestling. I don't like to go wrestle. <laughs> now wrestling. I may have some country slang, but. <laughs> <laughs> wrestling from Missouri. But anyway, so this is the real estate investing mastery podcast. And I wanted to get Dixie on the podcast with us and talk about her business. She is the nation's leading expert on student housing. Yep. which I think is going to be really important for you guys because there's a lot of students out there. There's a lot of universities out there. And um, so this is a, a little niche that's very, it's a very profitable niche in the real estate investing space. I met Dixie uh, in Ohio when we were both one of the, some of the speakers at a, a big national convention there. And um, I know talking to a lot of my students that were there, talking about how awesome Dixie was. And so I said, hey, can we get you on the podcast? And she said, yes, let's do it. Um, she's from Springfield, Missouri. You got it. Okay, good, good. I'm having a hard time hearing you, Dixie. I don't know if it's me, but um, just so if you can make sure you speak up, it's probably my fault, but I'm, I okay. apologize. Okay, no worries. Uh, so anyway, um, Guys, if you want show notes, I'm starting to transcribe all of my podcasts now. Um, so if you can, if you want the transcriptions of this podcast, if you want the show notes, uh, go to realestateinvestingmastery.com. Just do a search for Dixie and you'll see her show there. Realestateinvestingmastery.com. Get the show notes, get the transcriptions, uh, subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And um, so, Dixie, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad you're here. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about you okay. and how did you get started in real estate and when? Okay. So, I'm going to try to keep it really short um, as far as kind of my story. And it's not my favorite part to tell, I guess, because it's like the doom and gloom of it. And it's really that cliche story of broke to millionaire and it all started really in 2010. So I had been married for 10 years. I had two kids and life was not going well. Um, in my relationship, there was emotional abuse, physical abuse. Um, there was drugs and alcohol. There was other women that I didn't know about. And I said no more. So I really said no more because I, the last episode my daughter witnessed and she was almost five and I just said, this isn't the life that they deserve. It's not the life that I deserve and it's time to, to be done with this. So at that time I was working a $30,000 a year job. Um, he was so kind as to leave me with everything, meaning all the debt, the 3,500 square foot house on five acres, the vehicles, and $150,000 in credit card debt with my beautiful credit score that I thought I still had. Um, he had taken out a bunch of credit cards without me knowing. Oh, so wow. uh, that led into the bankruptcy. I survived that for three years and I finally went through that in 2013. So between 2010 and 2013, I spent a lot of time eating at my mom and dad's house to feed the kids and uh, sold the big house and started life over. So I ran into my seventh grade best friend and he said, you should go to this real estate thing with me um, on Saturday in, I think it was Kansas City. And I was like, okay, he was this entrepreneur in real estate, this investor. And I said, oh, okay, you know, I'd always loved real estate. I had gotten my mortgage license and my real estate license during that 10 year marriage because he was a builder. And so I thought, well, I can list houses and I knew traditional real estate. You know, you have good credit, you go to a bank, you get a loan. I had bought my first house when I was 18 because I did take pride in my credit score and I had the job. And so I knew how to do that. 
So I'm like, sure, I'll go. So my mom says, yeah, I'll watch the kids. So I go up on a Saturday and I met who is now my mentor that day. And that's when the world opened up to me. Meaning things like you teach your listeners all the time about lease options. I learned what that was. I had no idea that existed. Uh, wholesaling. I had no idea that existed. Were you still in Missouri, Springfield at the yeah. time? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I had no idea this world even existed out here, as silly as that sounds. And I was like, I can have a life again. I can do real estate again because I don't have to have money or credit. You can do it without those things. And I think that was the aha moment where I knew I could have more and I deserved to have more and I could start my life over. So I just went gangbusters. That first year in uh, 2014, I did 37 transactions. And yeah, and during that year, um, Brandon, who's now... I don't know if I told you, Joe, we got engaged and we're getting married this year. Um, so, Is this the friend from seventh grade? Yes. Oh, how about that? <laughs> so, was, he at, was he at the Ohio event? He didn't come to Ohio. He got to stay home and take care of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Good hey, thanks. So, um, yeah, we joined forces to run the business together. We started dating and we, he, when he had gotten out of the military, he had that like GI money from going to war and he could come back and go to college. So when he did that before we had met him and his buddy, battle buddy, fixed up this little house around campus and rented it out to some college kids. And this was uh, what year? Uh, I bet that was 2010 for him. Okay. 2010 for him. So he had once told me about this. And then when we got into that, new real estate world with creative financing, subject to lease options, owner financing. The goal was to find a tenant buyer to put in these houses we acquired. And we couldn't get rid of one of them because it was by campus. So I said, well, why don't we try this, that thing that you did with that one house and you rented it to college students. And so we did and it worked. So yeah. then we just did it some more and some more because the cash flow was two to three times more than what any single family rental was bringing in, even on a lease option. Why, why is that? Well, you get to charge by the room. So I can get between 450 and 600 a room instead of 800 for a four bedroom house. It's awesome. Right? So that makes it awesome. And then because of my past and being scared to death to ever go back to that life again, um, I love the student housing because I can put those three or four kids on one lease and then their parents co-sign it and they're all jointly responsible for ah. the full amount of the rent, not so just for that's, a little That's really important. I don't know if everybody's listening. <laughs> that's the secret. S say that again. So we, we price the, the bed to the student but they all get together, they know each other, they come to us as a group and we have them sign one lease with everybody on it and parents co-sign it. So like if there's four kids, all four parents, sets of parents have to sign it? If I can get all four. So quite frankly, if I can get two of four, I'm happy with it. Yeah, get the richest ones. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. Um, did I lose you? Nope, I'm still here. Oh, okay, okay. My, my screen disappeared. Sorry. Um, so what, give us an example. Like, well, in this example, the, it's, it's how many bedrooms was the house? That house was a three-bedroom house. Three bedrooms. And then how many beds did you have in there that you were renting out? I just, I just marketed it as a three-bedroom house, and I put one kid per bed, per bedroom in there. I don't furnish it. And we were marketing it as a tenant buyer house for about eight fifty a month, and then I marketed it to students for four fifty per room. Wow. Okay. So then, but they do they have to be friends or are um, so you they have to know each other already. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. So I won't match make them. I did that one time, and it was it was a really miserable twelve month period. So I, I don't match make anymore. <laughs> okay. So it's got to be. They kind of uh, find themselves. They get together yes. and say, hey, let's do this. Okay, nice. Well, so how do you advertise that then? How do you say that in your ads? Like 
so I, I advertise just like you market any house with the exception of in say our Zillow ad, it shows 450 for the house. Well, in the ad, we just add in there, you must fill the whole unit and it's priced per bedroom. So nice. then, yeah, so then they bring us their friends and they're, they made friends that freshman year of college yeah, from yeah. a dorm or a sorority or fraternity house or something like that. So they already know how many friends they want to live with, two, three, four, five, or whatever the case is. Nice. And then, um, so you're, when you advertise a three-bedroom house on Zillow, you're advertising it how is a one bedroom for 450? No, a three bedroom house for 450. <laughs> so now so here's a lot of interest in it. I you know. do. So that's the risk you you gamble with a little bit is you yeah. get you get junk calls. Um, of course I have a virtual assistant that sifts through all that junk for me for super cheap, but that's the risk you run. And then sometimes I play with it and I'll market it for the full rate because college kids are looking in a certain, you know, radius of the university. But we, we get more calls off of the price per bed. And this is a 12-month lease. Yes. You don't, you don't let them do month to month or just nine months? No, because I don't have any vacancies and I don't have any evictions for college students. And so I, we tell them up front, this is a 12-month lease. We understand you may go home during the summer. Some of you won't. You'll have jobs during the summer. So what we this advise... This yep. Time. So what we advise you do is if you're not going, if you do go home for the summer, find somebody who needs to sublease during the summer from you and just bring that, bring us their application and we'll sublease it to them for you. But so they, they don't have to still, you're still collecting 450 per room. Yes. Yes. So essentially they know they're responsible for it. If they don't find a friend to bring in, if they go home, they still have to pay it. And the way I kind of do my math is whatever they pay at the dorms for the nine months, right? Because they go home during the summer from the dorms, whatever they pay in those nine months, that's what I set my rate for, except really? for 12 months. So they get my place for 12 months or they get the dorm for nine months and they're paying the, the same, same money. The same cost. Right. And then I tell the parents because everyone goes, why would anyone sign a 12 month lease? I said, well, I just asked the parents a pretty simple question. Would you like to spend your vacation days taking a vacation instead of coming down to Springfield, Missouri and moving your kids out of their dorm in the middle of May? And then you've got to bring them back in the middle of August and move them back in. Wouldn't it be much better just to leave them put? And they're like, oh, yes. That's and when I, yeah, and if you meet anybody that has a college kid, they know they have to go move their kid out of the dorm and then they got to go move them back in every year. Okay. What about uh, utilities? How do you do utilities? I try to never pay utilities. <laughs> okay. I've done that too. And they respect it a lot more if they have to pay the bill. And I tried to do, you know, I, I met some other investors along the way as I was learning all of this. They said, well, just put a cap on it. Like if they go over 150, then you have to pay me the difference. Oh my gosh. Do you know how hard it is to chase down $50 oh. at a time? No. It's miserable. No. So I just said, okay, no more. They pay their own utilities and then I don't have to chase money because I want to work smarter, not harder. <laughs> Would it, um, okay. So when, when you're withdrawing the rents, um, you're, who, it's just one payment that you're taking like yeah. is it a, do you requ do, do you uh, require like a bank account and you withdraw the money or do you do you wait for them to send you a check so when i first started out i was the like microsoft spreadsheet girl just getting checks delivered by mail or they would walk them into the little one bedroom one bedroom office we had so we did that for a while now we have switched over to Appfolio, a property management system, yeah. and they have their online portal. They pay right through there. And the two things that I did was we do tell them we want one lump payment. So like usually one kid's in charge and everybody pays that kid and then he pays the bill. We tell them if they want to pay separately, that's fine with us, but rents an extra $50 a month if they pay separately. Interesting. Because we got to process more money and all that stuff. And they go, okay. What, what do they normally do? They usually just log on and somebody pays it through that portal. All is one check. 
Well, one of the things I like to do with my rentals is require that I get their checking account number and do an ACH withdrawal one mm-hmm. the days they get paid. Because mm-hmm. um, then they don't have to worry about it. It could be every two weeks. It could be the first and the 15th, but that just gets like the taxes just gets withdrawn. Our friendly federal government likes to do that to us. Why can't I do that as a landlord, yeah. right? Right. Is there any way you could do that as well? I think at Folio will let the parents set that up. So a lot of times the parents will even log on and set it up to go auto draft uh, ACH right out of their bank accounts. I haven't played with that yet. And, and really in this niche, I never really worry about getting paid because the parents are paying the rent. This is stressing me out, Dixie. I don't stress about it. (laughs) No, but my kids, my, I have a 15 year old and a 13 year old boys and they're getting ready to go to college soon. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have that landlord like you. (laughs) that's going to make me responsible for their rent. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it will happen. No, it's not going to happen, Joe. You're going to go buy one with your lease option (laughs) and you're going to put your kid in it and then you're going to get the rent from your kid's friends. That's exactly right. (laughs) Exactly right. Um, I'm just writing down these questions. So you could actually, you could go buy these properties creatively as well. So you're not, um, you're not going out and and, uh, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Um, I want to find out how you find these properties. Okay. I want to know if you do this, can you do this out of state? Cause you're in Springfield. There's a big couple universities there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, do you do this in other markets? I have not moved markets. Uh, the reason is because our university, the one that I get fed off of, let's say it is Missouri state university and it has a little over 24,000 students enrolled. But on campus, they can only house a little over 4,000 of them. Wow. So 20,000 students need a place to live. I, I don't need to go anywhere else yet. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Right? Um, yeah, you have some big Christian colleges there in Springfield, too. Does it matter? Do you prefer one or the other? Um, I have a theory or a formula, and it's what I just gave you. It's really what is your enrollment versus what can live on campus? And if they have no dorms at all, that one's probably out because they're definitely commuters still living with mom and dad or they're on a super tight budget and mom and dad probably aren't going to be involved. So any when you're looking at something, I say, let's let's do the numbers on it like that to make sure we have a demand. And then it can work for any college as long as they have the ability to put some people in on campus housing, but not enough for everybody. Okay, so you don't do any. um... You don't do any uh, uh, furnishing of the apartment or the. I don't the do any furniture. Landscaping, you do it. Do you take care of that? I will mow if it's a duplex or more, and if the yard is just super big or doesn't have a garage, I will mow. But if it does have a garage, they get to mow it themselves. Mm-hmm. I will tell you though, the girls, the groups of girls that move into houses. Their boyfriends go home for the summer and then the lawn doesn't get mowed anymore. So, you know, you might want to pay for mowing every couple of weeks. And just I would, I would think that, yeah, it's not that expensive. No. Is it? It's and you can still you can add it to their rent. Yes. Make them pay for it. Um, and you still find it's easier to make them pay utilities than it is to just tack it onto the rent and you pay it them yourself. Yeah, because mom and dad give them like a budget of so many dollars per month. When your kid goes off to college, you say you've got $600 a month and that's your food and rent. I'm not giving my kids any money. <laughs> I had to work so hard when I went to college. Like I I had, I went to college full time and I worked 20 to 30 hours a week, sometimes more. Yep. And I was on my own. Yep. Well, there's a lot that aren't like that. <laughs> Gosh. So then they spend that money for beer or food yeah. and then you don't get it. You don't get to charge them for it in utilities and the parents will pay it eventually. The, the over overages and utilities, they will, or you'll get it out of the security deposit down the road, but it's just not worth it. It's easier for them to take care of it. Okay. Um, let's talk about guys versus girls. Uh, <laughs> what Can do we you do that? <laughs> What do I prefer? 
So I think it can go both ways, but I probably like the boys better. <laughs> oh, I'm surprised. I was. I thought you were going to say the opposite. Well, I, here's the deal. Uh, I have I have two daughters, so I love girls. I know how they behave and act, and they seem much cleaner and calmer than boys for sure. But what happens is the girls have all this makeup and hairspray, and they self tan and all this stuff, and then they're still lazy and they don't like to clean in college and. Girls' parents don't quite baby the girls so much, and they say, go clean up your own mess. The boys' mamas will come down and clean the house for them. Oh, my gosh. Are so, you <laughs> I kind of, I kind of, you know, I'm like, ah, oh, the mama, the boys' mamas kind of spoil them. So, I always know it's a cleaner house in the end when the boys live there, because mamas come down and clean it because they want their security deposit back. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, <laughs> Talk about maintenance and repairs. Is it yeah. more challenging with student housing for maintenance and repairs? Because a lot of times these are older houses too, right? Well, they are, but a lot of the stuff I buy, I either buy it already fixed up from a parent who bought it for their kid and now their kid's graduated, or I do buy it with private money and then I rehab it myself so I don't have any maintenance, like regular type maintenance stuff. So I do this, um, I think it's a 16 minute video on YouTube and it gets sent to every single tenant before they're allowed to sign their lease and move in with us. And it basically says, we're not your mamas. And toilet handles don't break themselves. Holes don't punch themselves in the walls. So if you do any of these things, you need to call and get it fixed yourself. And if you don't, your mom and dad are going to find out about it and they're going to have to pay the bill. And the parents get the video too because they're co-signing. Yeah. So... I, I mean, aside from like your major mechanical things, heating and air, plumbing, and a roof, I don't have a lot of maintenance because this stuff doesn't break itself. It just doesn't. The most common thing is a garbage disposal. And typically they have to pay for that as well because it's a beer bottle cap down in there. It's a lime rind. It's an orange rind from their blue moon beer or whatever. So we tell them up front, if you call us about your garbage disposal, we'll get a plumber out there. But when he takes a picture of whatever's stuck down there, you're going to pay his bill. And they're like, okay. So I, I don't have a lot of issues with it. And the cool part is when, when I do have my live trainings here in Springfield, I take a bus of people around to my properties so they can actually see that the walls look as clean as your walls behind you. And they cannot ever believe it. But what happens is I only move students in and out of houses in the summer. So at the very end of May in 2018, we moved out 24 houses and we moved in 24 houses the following day. That's Holy how God. clean they leave them. So you have about 24 properties right now in Springfield? No, I probably have a little over 60. Okay. Uh, so I did 24 at the end of May. I think I did four at the end of June. And then we did another 10 at the end of July. And everybody else rented for another year. So they didn't do any moving in or moving out. They didn't graduate. They didn't do any of that stuff. And of course, I don't turn them over anymore. My assistant does all of that. And really, all she has to do is the paperwork to check them in and out because they leave them all really in great condition because mom and dad came down and made sure of it because they want their $2,000 security deposit back. Yeah, so you, you take that security deposit really seriously. Absolutely. And parents know, hey, I'm, we're taking this very seriously. Yes, and the, the way we phrase that I think is very important is we tell them, hey, we want you to be successful living here. And we want to give you back every dollar of that security deposit. Because if we get to give it back to you, that means you left us a clean, gorgeous house and no harm, no foul. Other landlords who only get $800 in a security deposit for a single family rental, around here in Springfield, Missouri, almost every landlord has to steal that deposit so they can cash flow that property for the year. I don't need to. So I use it as a reward token to say, hey, we want you to be successful and get this back. I only kept two security deposits last year for dirty carpets, and I have 276 students living with us right now. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, okay, I want to talk about parties. What do you do and how do you pre Well, first is about pre-screening. <laughs> 
what do you do for pre-screening and what do you do about parties? Do you have rules about that? Um, you're going to really cringe at this probably, or every landlord listening is. I've never ran a single background check on any college student or their parents living in any of my houses. Because I don't need you know, to. That, that's understandable. Yeah. I don't need to. So if they're if they're accepted into that college, and they're they're probably already in pretty good standing, and they've got their parents who are co-signing everything. Right. So I, I don't even I wouldn't even tell you be able to tell you what company to go do that with because I just don't do it. <laughs> and it's a waste of money to do it on the college kids because most of the time they don't have any credit. They probably never had a job. Mom and dad are still taking care of them. So it's it's really not a big deal. The second question you asked me about the parties. Yes. Uh, they're going to happen. Get over it. Their moms are going to come clean it up. So don't worry about it. Um, we just have the city, city no, uh, noise ordinance in the lease and that's it. So if they do, we just tell them, Hey, if the police come, that's your problem. It's not our problem, you know? And so I think, Let's see, we started this like 2014. So for almost five years, I've had two neighbors call about parties. And I just have to say, I, you know, I advise you call the police. That's what I would do yeah. because it's, it's, a, it's a people problem, not a property problem. Yeah. And, and so it's self-managed. And I tell people, if, if you want to control them having parties, this is the wrong business for that. All you need to do is care about how they treat the property and how they leave the property. Do you ever get invited to the parties? Do you ever go? Uh, so we occasionally have those those college kids that say, hey, we're cooking. We're cooking this. You guys could come on over, you know. Um, but in September, I ran my live training here in Springfield. And we go to my students' house, my college students' houses. So I had a bus of 50 investors loaded up. That week before they came, my assistant called the houses and said, hey, we wanted to let you know we're going to be by on Saturday. We've got a few investors. We want to show them how the house looks because they're interested in doing this in another state. And they were like, uh, we're kind of having a party on Saturday. Um, it's, it's a home football game and it's parents weekend. And we're like, it's fine. You know, if you guys can just be respectful when everyone's there, we don't mind. It's no problem. They come through the office door about an hour later and they're hanging their head down low. And they said, Miss Jessica, when we told you we were having a small party, we really meant 150 people in the backyard. I said, no, we cannot take a bus full of investors to a house with 150 people in the backyard. But I had, I, I'd already set the route and it was already ready. And I promised when I started teaching this niche that I would be transparent and you get to see, I don't go clean their houses before we get on that bus. I mean, what you see is what you get. Yeah. So we did, we took that bus there. We showed up. There was indeed 150 people on a Saturday morning in this backyard. And you know who was right amongst all those college students? Their parents. The parents wow. were there manning the party the house looked great. They kept everything in the backyard and I could not get off that bus. I'm not going to, I'm not going to fib you. I had, I was like, I have so much anxiety. I can't get off this bus right now because. <laughs> but how cool really, the parents were there. There was at least, we saw at least four sets of parents in, it was two houses that I had that sit next door to each other. So between them is six students and there was at least four sets of parents we identified in the yards as we came up on the bus. Oh, and after we left, we had an email from one of the students that said, hey, my dad is really interested in doing what you guys do. Or if you're interested in having mm. some kind of partner or funding, he'd be interested mm. in it. So who Those knew? Private, private investors. Who knew? Wow. Yeah, so crazy. But yeah, so they definitely have tailgate parties <laughs> at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Do you, do you manage your own properties or do you have a property management company? Uh, I do self-manage. And by saying that, my assistant really does everything for me now. She does all the showings. She does the marketing. She gets all the leases signed. She checks them in and out. And I do very, very little except when I want to make sure things are going right. I'll, I'll make sure I show up on turnover day to make sure everything is still being implemented. And they do a really great job. 
And so one assistant can manage all of that for you. So far, we are in need of another one right now. Uh, I have a four-story apartment building going in this, this winter right now that we're actually building and uh, another handful of properties that we've picked up and, and are renting out. So it is time for another person to help her out. But what's, what's crazy, I, I, I like that though, because a lot of people think you got to get a property management company yeah. to manage your property when sometimes the best thing to do would just be to hire an assistant. Yes. You'll, you'll, depending on how many doors you have, you might even save money. But that one assistant now is just managing your properties, not five, you know, not, not 20 other investors. Correct. Um, <clears throat> okay, cool. Another question I had is inspections. Do you do regular inspections on these properties? We don't. Um, the only thing I do, I guess you could call it an inspection, is I do have a handyman go around for one day and he changes all the filters on my properties every quarter. And okay. so if there were to be something catastrophic, I guess he would let us know, but there hasn't been. So we, we do that. Um, otherwise, we don't really show up unless we're showing the property. And usually, I only have to show a house one time and it's rented. Yeah. Okay, nice. Another question I had is, will you talk a little bit about how you find these deals? Um, do you, what kind of marketing do you do? And what percentage of them are you buying with cash or creatively with some you know, owner financing or lease options. Okay. Uh, so that those numbers kind of change as the market changes. I've noticed when I first started, everything I did was creative financing and a little bit of private lending because I wasn't bankable. I couldn't do anything traditional as we've grown and the markets in, you know, kind of going up, I am probably into, I'd say I'm 40% creative financing this year and I'm up to about 60% private funding. Okay. But I've been doing, I, I have nine rehabs going on right now. So that's usually when I do a lot of private lending is when I'm rehabbing them. So that changed this year and I rehab them really nice because I'm, I'm a hold, I'm holding, I'm a long-term strategy. Um, so that was the two I'd say that's my percentages. When I started off, it was all creative and I only had one little private lender I found, but then that's kind of grown over the years. So very little bank financing. Right. Now, sometimes I'll do bank financing with a credit partner because it's my, it's a, my little form of private lending, I, I guess you could say, because they don't have liquid cash, but they have really good credit scores and they have a day job and they don't want to be involved in real estate. So I'll partner up with someone like that and they can go get the bank loan. And then I just put the whole deal together. I don't sign on anything. And typically when I do that, I get 70% of the deal and they get 30% of the deal. Yeah, I was gonna ask, how do you split, when you have a private investor lending you money, do you pay them a percentage or uh, like an interest rate or do you pay them a percentage of the deal? So a credit partner, I do the percentage of deal. If they are liquid, meaning they're basically the bank, then I just do an interest rate anywhere from 6% to 10%, depending on how long I want to hold it and what they want and what the deal will allow, all of those things. Is it, how, is it uh, challenging to get uh, bank financing on student housing like this? So I have a lot of investors that have learned student housing and they'd have no desire to learn how to do creative buying. So they go get bank loans. They're just getting a bank loan on a single family house. Yeah. So this term you and I are talking about today, student housing is only what we use yeah. in any other facet. It's just a single family house being rented with one lease in place as a single family rental. So okay. for insurance purposes and everything else, it's just a single family house rental. This is so cool. I mean, you're getting on average, like on a, on a normal three, three bedroom house, you're getting an extra $500 a month in rent. Yes. Easy. On top of what you normally would. Yeah. And your vacancies are practically zero. Right. That's amazing. They're only vacant and if I buy them in the middle of something and I just don't have them rented yet. Otherwise, um, so it's, we're just the beginning of January. The kids in college are just coming back from their Christmas break. Before they left for Christmas break, our goal is to have 75% of our properties pre-leased for the next whole year 
meaning they all signed leases before Christmas to move in this summer wow, to stay really? through the next summer. So I sleep really good at night because I know I am 100% occupied until 2020. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. <laughs> Very cool. Um, how do you find your deals? What kind of marketing do you do? Oh, so you're, you're going to slap me for this and your listeners are going to cringe for this. But right now I'm doing no marketing at all. Um, I, when I first started, I was the yellow letter girl, the postcard girl. I put bandit signs out, everything. Now, because I guess there's so many of these gurus coming to town. There's so many green investors out there do, spending all their dollars doing all that marketing. And then they don't know what to do with a deal. So I have networked, I guess, with enough people at our local RIA meetings yeah, yeah. and things like that to say, hey, when you get a deal, you don't know what to do with it, bring it to me and I'll either buy it as a wholesale or we'll structure it as creative financing and I'll pay you something to just get out of the way. Yeah, and yeah. so people just bring us deals all the time because they don't know what to do with them. So even in a smaller market like Springfield, Missouri, you, you have a lot of competition there for deals. Oh my gosh. We re we actually really do. There is um, two or three of us that actually travel and teach real estate in some facet. And we live here in Springfield. We run our businesses here in Springfield. And so we're competitors for sure, but we're not because we all really work well together, but there's a slew of other new investors all the time. I mean, there's two or three bandit signs on every corner and none of them are mine. <laughs> how, how competitive is it for the, the, the landlords like you looking for these kinds of houses? Well, most landlords cringe at the thought of college kids because they don't understand it or they don't run it properly or they just hand over keys and say, good luck. And, and as we talked earlier, I really dangle that carrot about their success staying in our properties from the very beginning. And we don't sugarcoat anything. We tell them right up front, if you do this, this is what happens. And so there's a little bit of competition for those very old landlords that have been around for years and they still have the slummy houses, the college kids are partying in and their floors are crooked and the beer pong tables and your shoes stick to the floors. Those are still out there. They're just not my properties because mine are granite, tile, hardwood. They're gorgeous. Uh -huh. I get, I get a gorgeous amount of rent per room as well because they're gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm getting some questions here. Okay. Um, and we got to wrap it up anyway. We're right at the top of the hour. Um, so guys, if you're watching us right now on Facebook, go ahead and type your questions in because we only got a couple more minutes with Dixie. Um, how can people get a hold of you and what's a good website to go to? Uh, DixieDecker.com. DixieDecker.com. D-I-X-I-E Decker, D-E-C-K-E-R. Cool. Yeah. And you've got a free report right there that people can get. What does that I report do? do? It just kind of tells them why student housing. So it's a little bit about what we talked about today. Uh, it'll get them in in so they'll get the next free training that comes out and they can learn more. So more than what you and I can even chat about here uh, today. And then they can decide if that's something that interests them. I have a lot of fun with it though. And I think no matter what niche you're in, you should have a lot of fun with it. So even when I did it all myself, I just had fun doing it. And I think you should love whichever niche you pick, or maybe you only need one or two of these things to start replacing some of that day job income. Yeah. And I like it because I don't have to scale this business. Every investor I run into these days is just chomping at the bits to scale bigger and better and faster. And I, I don't really have to because they spit off so much income. I don't need 500 houses. Well, this is amazing. You've, you've got it. You've built your net worth up to over $5 million and you're getting over a hundred thousand dollars a month in positive cash flow from these student housing, right? Going from, Devastating divorce and bankruptcy, a mother yes. of two, rebuilding your life. That's amazing, Dixie. Good yeah. for you. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Um, so again, guys, if you want more information about Dixie, I, we just scratched the surface, but I <laughs> wanted to open your eyes to the possibility of student housing. Um, and we're not talking about buying huge apartment complexes and renting them out to students. We're talking about bread and butter, single family homes, renting them out by the room, getting mom and dad to co-sign the lease, 
making 500 more dollars a month in cash flow than what you would normally get. Um, and these students are taking actually real good care of the homes. So you got to manage them right. If you want more information about how Dixie does this, go to DixieDecker.com. Um, I'll put the show notes. That link will be in the show notes. You can go to realestateinvestingmastery.com, look up Dixie in the search bar, you'll find the podcast. Also, there will be a transcription of this podcast there as well. Um, anything else you want to say, Dixie, before we uh, wrap it up? Uh, not really, just whatever you pick, just go for it. Take some action, don't reinvent the wheel, do what someone else has already done. And most of the people that are successful do that. They don't go create some new system. And I, although student housing sounds like a new system, I bought them the same way you teach. I bought them the same way my mentor taught me to. And I just dialed in my systems to be a better landlord than anybody else and monopolized on the success points with the parents being involved. So if you don't do those things, you won't have the same, same success. So you'll come back to me and say, well, they left the house just a mess. Well, did you get the parents to co-sign? No. Okay, well, parents weren't involved. You did it to yourself. And we've all partied in those houses. If you went to college for even one semester, you know what that looks like. <laughs> I didn't. I was too busy working, <laughs> which is what my kids are going to do when they're going to college. I'm not going to be that parent. My daughter, I'll make this really quick. My daughter's 15. She's searching for her first real job because she wants a car. And I'm kind of the same way as you. I'm not paying your way for stuff, you know? So she did the math and she says, oh my gosh, mom, I have to work 25 hours a week at this teenage job to make the same amount of money you're making off one house in one month with college kids in it. But she has to work 25 hours per week, every single week to have that same income. So are you teaching her the business? We are. We are. I'm actually taking my two boys next week to a boot camp in Tampa, Florida. Um, she signed up to go to one in Jacksonville in May when she's out of school. So uh, she's excited. I could teach excited. it myself. I want them to hear it from somebody else as well. Yes. And um, so cool. Thanks for being on the show, Dixie. Hey, thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Guys, uh, check out Dixie's page, DixieDecker.com. You can probably, are you on Facebook and all that too? I am. All right, good. Just look her up. And um, go to the realestateinvestingmastery.com to get the show notes and the transcription and all the links for this. Um, we appreciate you, Dixie. Congratulations on your engagement. Thank you. And um, we'll see you later. Thanks again, right. guys. Thanks, Joe. Bye-bye.